actually each and every one of us is a leader every day in interaction, every interaction we're having. We've got a choice as to whether we use those interactions to spark change and be a source of positive influence um, or whether we choose not to. But each and every one of us has that choice. And there's small change, you know, and small moments are big moments, are big change, you know, in the context of people's lives and situations. So we need to not give over our agency and actually take back that power and responsibility that all of us have to be the change in the world that we want to see. I'm excited to welcome you, my guest all the way from Australia, Holly Ransom. She has been named Australia's 100 Most Influential Women, nominated as the Future Game Changer by Sir Richard Branson, co-chaired Geo20 Youth Summit, and she's interviewed President Barack Obama and has delivered a peace charter to the Dalai Lama, and she is also the founder and CEO of Emergen. Holly Ransom is a global renowned content creator, powerful speaker, and master questionnaire with the belief that if you walk past it, you will tell the world it's okay. In her newest book, The Leading Edge, Dream Big, Spark Change, and Be the Leader the World Needs You to Be, it helps people harness their own potential to lead by asking better questions, thinking beyond biased answers, and building collective momentum for change. Thank you again so much for coming on Passion Love Pursuit podcast. I know we had this planned, I think, a couple months ago, and I'm just so happy we made this happen. It's just such a pleasure to be able to connect from somebody all across all across the oceans and be able to connect with somebody on the other side of the world, such as Australia. And I'm here in Los Angeles. So it's just such a pleasure to connect face to face and share ideas and impact. So thank you for being on the show. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Great. Well, so I did begin to read your book, uh, your book, The Leading Edge, Dream Big, Spark Change, and Be the Leader the World Needs You to Be. Um, is that what it's called? The That is correct. Spot okay. on. Uh, so I read it a couple months ago, and even though I haven't got through it all and being able to complete it so far, absolutely loving it. And awesome. I feel just I love the insight and the stories that you share. And then the message, of course, you share so beautifully in every chapter and you really get the readers questioning things and taking actions on what they learn through your book. So I just love it. So I'm just so happy that I got the privilege to read it in advance and I know it's available now. So of course, everybody, this will be in the show notes. So you're going to get inspired to grab this book as well. So one thing I want to mention, because you wrote this in an email to me that really intrigued me, and it was mm-hmm. specifically why I wanted to have you on uh, the show, because you stated that at the, let me read this. So at, at a time when we have multiple narratives building and converging on such as the climate change, the mental health epidemic, a global COVID pandemic, housing prices, mm-hmm. displaced populations, rising equality, and so on. We need to be sharing a light on positive change coming from right across the world. This book features hundreds of stories and lessons from a diverse array of leaders from all around the world. The leading edge is written as a call call to arms and to build on a hands-on tool book for future leadership. So the question is on what you said, how do we create positive change in our world? What is your perspective on this? Yeah, well, thank you for the question and, and the opportunity to chat. And, and I absolutely stand by that. I think it, it's so critical that at this moment in time where it's so easy, you know, in the news cycle, in what we're consuming on social media day to day to be, you know, a little bit deflated about the state of things, a little bit frustrated, a little bit um, disappointed or perhaps, you know, worried or uncertain. I think the first thing I'd say about creating positive changes is it takes intention. You know, it takes that focus on, Um, inward first and that's part of why the first half of the book is all about leading self you know before you can lead others I was very fortunate uh, about 10 years ago actually to spend some time with the Dalai Lama uh, working on a project with him in Japan and you know I remember one of the things he said quite vividly he said you know till we're at peace with ourselves we can't be at peace with others and that's really part of why the first half of the book is written with all these strategies around how do you be the best version of you and what is it we can learn from, from great leaders and influencers about how they do that? 
And so I think to begin with, it starts with the want to be the best version of yourself and to think about that question of why am I here and why, why you know, what's the why for me in my lifetime, my passion, my pursuit. Uh, and then I think the second thing that comes with that is what are the strategies and techniques that I've got to put in place every day to be really mindful of creating a positive change? Because it starts with building that around you so you can be in a position to do that outward. So that's things like building a really strong support structure around yourself. That starts, Erica, before we got going, we were talking about you know gratitude practices and well-being and, and how important it is to be mindful of focusing on getting those strategies in place. And then I think beyond when you've got yourself, you know, in a position where you're going, cool, I'm feeling really full. I'm feeling like uh, I'm doing a really good job um, being the best version of me I can be. I then think it's an attention to go beyond. It's a focus on, you know, what's my why and connection with others? What's the cause I'm passionate about? What do I believe I'm sort of on the planet to do? Whether that's build a great business, whether that's be a great parent, whether that's, you know, contributing to community uh, as fully as you can, whether it's showing up for people in every interaction you have with love and generosity. I mean, all of those are examples of leadership. And so I think being really mindful of what that looks like. And then again, kind of what's my strategy for how I'm going to bring that to life? You know, how am I going to write and think about my values? What does that mean I choose to say yes to when I choose to get involved in? And what do I not walk past? Because I believe in these things and that's the way that I want to show up. But I think one of the premises of the book was we need to challenge when we throw that word leadership around. I think it's lost its resonance for a lot of people. And part of what I wanted to do with the book is when you go and do the lit review of most of the library on leadership, most of the book looks like male military generals and, you know, a couple like Fortune 500 CEOs, again, majority white men, uh, elite sport coaches. You can see a theme that's not all that diverse. And so what I really wanted to do is challenge what leadership can look like because a lot of us I think when we read those books go oh if that's what a leader looks like I, I must not be able to be a leader I must not be able to drive positive change and, and you and I both know that's not true I mean your your podcast is a great example of people who do not fit that mold who are driving incredibly positive change right throughout the world so it was a want to, to challenge that and go actually each and every one of us is a leader every day in interaction every interaction we're having We've got a choice as to whether we use those interactions to spark change and be a source of positive influence um, or whether we choose not to. But each and every one of us has that choice. And there's small change, you know, and small moments are big moments, are big change, you know, in the context of people's lives and situations. So we need to not give over our agency and actually take back that power and responsibility that all of us have to be the change in the world that we want to see. So beautifully said. I absolutely agree with you. And I think leadership has been thrown around and I think it's lost. It's, it's really, uh, if you want to say the, the foundation of what it really means to be a leader and really embody that. So I kind of want to walk through a lot of the things you mentioned. So I, I feel leadership has, is a very important topic today because of really what we've experienced over the last couple of years. I could only speak for my country, uh, my personal view, but what I've learned, you have the privilege of learning from a vast amount of people of leadership across the world. So I would love to just begin by sharing what you got in, what got you into the position to interview such powerful figures and the accomplish you, accomplishments you have had today. I'm just curious, like what, can you kind of share your story of how you were able to have the privilege of that opportunity to interview such great leaders and learn from them? Yeah, I think it starts, I, I feel all of us, there's something to be had in our earliest memory. And I opened the book with my earliest memory, which is being at a supermarket in Australia with my grandmother, who's been an incredibly strong and positive influence on in my life and, and probably one of my best leadership role models. Though grandma would never probably have, you know, uh, used that word about herself, which I think is part of the, the, the premise I want to challenge. And we're in a line and the person in front of us in the checkout queue uh, is absolutely having a go with the poor young woman on the checkout, you know, who's checking out his groceries because she'd given him the wrong change and he was really letting her know about it. He was really big guy. Certainly when I was four or five years old, he looked like a giant and he was quite aggressive and he was getting in this girl's face. And before I know it, you know, my five foot tall grandma had inserted herself between this giant and this young girl on the checkout. And she pointed her finger up at him and said, how dare you talk to that young woman like that? You apologize. 
And I just remember this this moment of uh, quite vividly uh, of just um, <laughs> watching this all play out in front of me, feeling like I was fixed to the ground like a deer in the headlights. And this guy looked like he'd never been told off in his life. He sort of took a few seconds to register what was going on, mumbled sorry, kind of rushed his way out of the store. And grandma took a few seconds. She proceeded like nothing had happened, bought her, you know, milk and bread and whatever else she was getting and then went to leave the store before she realised I wasn't still holding her hand. And when she came back to get me, I said to her, you know, grandma, that was so brave. And she said to me, honey, when you walk past it, you tell the world it's okay. Mm. Now, I didn't understand what grandma meant in terms of the words that she'd used there at that age and stage of my life that has taken on all layers of meaning over my journey so far, but I understood what she did. And I think that was the real power in that moment. You know, she showed me what it was like to not walk past something that wasn't okay. You know, she didn't have any title. She wasn't manager of a store. There was nothing that gave her authority in that moment to step in and correct it, but she did. And she demonstrated to me that that's what we need to do whenever we find you know, disrespect or whenever we find situations of inequality, we need to not walk past it. Mm. And so I think when I look at the, the choices I've made in my life, whether it's the jobs I've got involved in, whether it's starting my own business six years ago, whether it's the nonprofits I, I, I play a role in supporting to this day, it's been, you know, finding a situation that I wasn't prepared to walk past and then going, okay, I want to get involved here and make an impact or I need to get involved here and build the skills um, in order to be able to be the change that I want to see in the world. And, and I think a long time ago, that, that saw me fall into speaking and hosting and moderating, in part because I'm passionate about the idea that until we change the conversation, we can't change the outcomes. And so there's enormous power in the questions that we ask and the stories that are told and who they're told by to the point we're touched on about diversity already. Um, and so it, it's a world that I didn't ever intend to be in, but I absolutely fell in love with. Um, and the opportunity to be with audiences and connect them into stories and ideas um, is something I've been doing for nearly a decade now. And increasingly, um, with the love of interviewing and moderating and getting the, the privilege to do that with Michelle Obama, you know, Malcolm Gladwell, um, Condoleezza Rice, Susan Cain, you know, wonderful thought leaders, Richard Branson, entrepreneurs, people that have incredible stories to tell. And, and the more that I do that, the more I get passionate about the power of those conversations. You know, you see the way that that meets people, you see the way their stories and examples inspire um, and how, how useful their advice can be. These people that have gone um, before and, and achieved impact in their own way. And people often say to me, you know, what's the commonality amongst these great people that you, you meet? If anything, is there any pattern, you know, that we can learn something from? And I would say they're in part the inspiration for the way the book's written about, again, self first, then others, because there's extraordinary sense of clarity of purpose mm. in all of these individuals. Yeah. And it's, it is quite extraordinary energy to be around. And, and Eric, I'm sure you found this with people that, that you interview. Sure. There's something about people who know what they're on the planet to do. And, and that doesn't happen when they're born. That comes from introspection and work and asking questions and putting themselves where lightning strikes, as I call it, to see what they're, they're fired up and passionate about. But there is this incredible degree of they know why they're here, they know what they stand for, and there's a real groundedness of their purpose and an ability to hear their message differently, I think, because of that. And the second thing I'd say is all of them have been courageous. I mean, the thing that we know about standing for anything is uh, it comes at a cost. There are critics, there are naysayers, there are people who don't agree uh, you know, there are detractors, there's social media trolls. I mean, all these people, every leader I know has critics. Uh, every thought leader I know has people who disagree with their opinion. So there's been a real courage by them to put their contribution out into the world in whatever way they've chosen to, whether that's in writing, whether that's in starting a company, whether that's being in public uh, leadership figure. And they've had the courage not just to do that once, but to keep at it to turn up again the next day, even when the day before was hard and to go again because they believe so strongly in their why. Um, they believe in, you know, the, the why of what they're here to do and, and how they want to make people feel or how they want, to, they want to change the world around them for the better. So I, I would say, you know, that's been a constant source of inspiration. But the, the journey, I can't say there was one moment that led me to the opportunity. It's sort of been this evolution of things that all began, you know, with my grandma saying, don't walk past it. And then this mm -hmm. understanding and connection for me that, you know, part of part of doing that is opening up a different kind of conversations. So more of us can go on that journey of finding 
finding change uh, points where we get inspired to be the change that we want to see in the world. So beautiful. I, I, I appreciate that you share the commonalities because I think that is something to really think about that we need to get so crystal clear on our, our why, our mission, our values, our beliefs. And, you know, of course, this is talked about so much, but I think so many people still struggle with it. I, I know for myself, I search for so long, what's my passion? What's my purpose? What am I meant to do? And it is something a lot of us, you know, hit our heads against the wall trying to figure out. So I'm just curious, how do you feel? And I've asked this question to multiple people, but I love how everybody could give a different answer. How do you feel we could determine these values, our mission, our purpose, our passion, and really get so crystal clear that we are just guided and we're always following that light? Yeah, it, it's such a great question. And, and I'd be intrigued for, for your own story is because when you, you know, you look at your website and your work, it's it's very clear what you stand mm-hmm. for. And, and so I'd be interested for your own story of, of kind of discovery there. But I think one of the things I opened the book with is talking about the power of the why and and kind of lessons I guess I've learned and lessons I've learned from others in how to find it. And the thing is, um, people will, will listen and hear this differently. Some of your audience will have that that passion and purpose. They'll be following it every day. Others will be, I'd love to find it, don't know how to. One of the things for me to begin with is to, to take the, the pressure and the expectation off that, that quest and go, actually, just be curious. What is it that you lose track of time when you're doing? What is it you have an absolutely insatiable interest in? What is it you find yourself you know, spending uh, hours reading about doing, getting involved in, demonstrating curiosity around, like just be be curious and, and observational about yourself to begin with, because there's there's truth hidden in that. Um, just as a lot of people, you know, I know when when I ask them about their passion, will often link back to something that they did in childhood that then someone mm. told them that they needed to put away in a box because it wasn't serious enough, it wasn't going to make a career for them, etc. But actually, when they go full circle, they're back pursuing their art, or they're back finding their their writing passion and bringing that to life, or they're running an environmental organization because they always cared and love spending time in nature. So it is really interesting, just those curiosity points. And I encourage people to begin with to, to start by being curious and, and writing that down, journaling, kind of exploring those things as they come up. Well, the second thing I always talk about is, you know, it's not going to land in your lap more often than not. Lucky if it does. But I talk about this idea of putting yourself where lightning strikes. So how do you put yourself in situations where you and your passion might collide? And by that, I mean, you know, the definition of insanity is keeping doing what we've always done and expecting we're going to get a different result. So if you haven't found it yet, you need to be changing up your weeks, months, days in order to try and collide with it and try and find that lightning bolt. So that might involve things like reading different stuff and listening to different um, material. It could involve choosing to sign up to get involved with a, a local organization in some free time and making a contribution to a cause you're really interested in or you know, a different way of working than the way that you do nine to five. Um, it might involve starting and giving your side hustle a go. Hey, let's see if I can make this, this idea that I've had on the back burner for a while into something. Um, you know, I tell the story of a woman called Jane Chuson who founded an incredible UK organization called Comic Relief. And she's the best person I know at not only herself and her, her career, uh, you know, the Comic Relief charity has raised over a billion dollars to help out, um, you know, causes in Africa and in the UK, which is just remarkable. Uh, And she's a great example of this in her own journey. And then collision points, it was her traveling to Africa and nearly dying and then uh, coming back and wanting to do something about the famine and poverty that led to comic relief. But she does this great thing with her charity that she now runs in Australia called um, Meet the People, Feel the Issues. And she takes CEOs and leaders all the time out into, you know, organizations that are helping uh, refugees find uh, employment and community in Australia, you know, organizations that are helping people really rehabilitate from drug and alcohol addiction, um, all sorts of fantastic causes where she'll take out the leading CEOs in the country and she'll get them to meet, meet the people and feel the issues. And I've never seen someone with a higher conversion rate of getting people involved in work because they just they hear stories, they connect with causes. They didn't know about them before and they go, oh my God, I want to do something. And I've never seen more passion lights turn on than by the way she works. And I think there's something in that. There's like, be curious. And if there are topics and things and people where you go, there's something in that. That's fascinating. I'm interested in that. 
lean into it. How can you get involved? How can you go to an information night, a volunteer day, um, you know, shadow the person that's running the organization or sit down for coffee for half an hour? They're the sorts of things I think that will unlock the passion piece for you. And then Erica, as you know, it's sort of that a layers of the onion. The more you lean into it, the clearer you can get. You just got to do that true. work continually on kind of refining in the direction of what you know you're passionate about. Mm, it's so true. And I, I, I remember as I was kind of unraveling my passion in, in discovering per se my purpose is by, yes, following, just following that spark if you want to say like when I do Love something that. what lights me up and just keep on going towards it and I also go towards my obstacles too I step into my fear opposed to resisting my fear so in a way I I've learned with myself the when I lean into my fear or my struggle that's actually the, where the work needs to be done. And that's where I mm. uncover new things that I didn't even know about myself. So personal development just for myself has been so, uh, well, number one, intriguing, just rewarding. Mm. And I just, I seek growth like no other. I, I, I like, I, it just makes me so happy to grow in any form that means in through any discomfort or anything so I just lean really in it and I also look listen for signs so I remember before starting my podcast I I went to a Starbucks and I remember this old man I would always see I would get my coffee and he's like you have such a he he saw me so many times such a happy joyful guy and he just says to me one day he's like you have this voice, like you should be interviewing people. Like you should be wow. like, you need to be speaking. And it just like, I, I took it in and I'm like, oh, thank you very much. It's funny because I've been commented so many times, you have this strong voice, never thought anything of it. And then when I thought of like the podcast and everything, I just put two and two together. I'm like, it was a sign, you know, it was, mm -hmm. it was a little tap, like, showing me a way that I needed to follow, you know? So there's been obviously several other things, but I think it's also like you mentioned the curiosity and noticing what lights you up, what sparks you. Mm. And um, it, it's a great path and journey to be on to discover all that. And I know that, you know, uh, you were, you did mention like be there where the lightning strikes, which I think is so beautiful. It's just opening your mind to the opportunities that you wouldn't normally see if you were doing the mundane things and the same thing over and over in your life. So we have to. Uh, I love too what you said there as well, because for me, there's, there's something so powerful that happens when we announce our intention to the universe. Like when we're brave enough to say, this is what I want or to start manifesting, you know, these are the sorts of opportunities I'm after and being really intentional about, you know, the way that that then ripples out when we tell people, when we're sharing that in convo with the guy at the Starbucks, you know, the way that that will come back to us, whether it's sources of encouragement, whether it's doors opening to opportunities, whether it's introductions to the, the next person we need to meet to further our journey, um, you know, that whole idea when the, the student's ready, the teacher appears. I think so that true. there's so much power in that. Yeah, so true. And also, I know you mentioned in the book uh, how we could ensure to articulate our purpose and values in such a way that they become embedded in our days. What do you suggest we do to make sure that our purpose and our values are an example in every part of our day? Yeah, well, this is one, you know, I really learned actually at a leadership forum in Los Angeles probably a decade ago. And uh, it, the, one of the speakers got up and he talked to, about values and he said, you know, one of the things you've got to be so mindful about is um, values need to be anchored to behavior. Um, mm -hmm. So anyone can use the word integrity or hard work. Um, and I know it's one of the things you do, you, you define, this is what passion means. This is what love means. This is what pursuit means. Right. Because if we said the word integrity, hard work, a passion even, you know, to a hundred different people, we'd probably get close to a hundred different answers. Each of us has like a slightly different nuanced view. And then if we went further and said, so what does it look like for you to be a person of integrity? What does it look mm. like for you to work hard? Everyone again would have all these different manifestations of what that looks like. And so I think one of the most powerful, but also the most challenging activities I've ever done is to sit down with a pen and paper and go, okay, what do my values mean to me? You know, what does it mean when I say I'm courageous? Um, what does it mean when I say I'm purposeful? 
Um, and how do I get really clear on that, what that means so I could check in at the end of the day with myself and go, did I live that today? There's kind of this personal accountability sort of at the end of your day when you're doing your gratitude practice as well, you can sit there and go, okay, if these, you know, and often, uh, you know, it's between three and five things for people. I always try and keep it around the three marks. That's often what we can hold in, um, in memory and kind of practice simultaneously is to say, did I do these three things today? And for me, the, you know, that definition piece is really key. And then like all good goal setting too, it's what's my practice of how do I make sure they're present with me every day? And by that, I mean, you know, a lot of us have goals uh, in our heads. The next step is then that we convert them to writing down. This is a very similar journey we can go on with thinking about passion and values. The next step when we've written them down is, are they somewhere we see them every day? Are we actually checking in with ourselves? Are they, you know, in front of us at our desk at work? Are they the background of our phone screensaver? Are they popping up a couple of times a day in, you know, one of our, our tools on our phone or on our computer to just interrupt our attention span and go, hey, how's the day going? Are we, are we doing what we should do relative to what we say is important to us? So thinking about some of those techniques and then and the other thing for me is then have we shared them with someone in our lives who can help us arrive there and who can uh, can kind of basically hold us accountable for them? And, and they might be different people, right? But I think there's also this piece around, and this gets to when we announce our intention to the world, it's amazing how things move. You know, to achieve anything, we have to be in concert with others, whether that is an active effort of teamwork or whether that's actually the role that each of us play as collaborators and sounding boards and sources of opportunity for others. So there for me, a couple of steps in the process, you've got to be prepared to do the work of actually writing it down and refining it and getting it to a place. And, and I say do the work, but there is something so incredibly energizing about the outcome of that work. Mm. Cause you know, when you get these things right, and I'm, I don't know if you feel this way, Erica, but for me, you know, the experience I've had interviewing people on this topic, when you land these things for you, they light you up. When you land these things for you, every time you read them, they kind of like make you tingle. And they're certainly really powerful because one of the reasons this stuff's worth defining is when you get to those tough choice points, when you get to those hard moments, they're the thing that bring you back too. They encourage you. They remind you of why you're on the journey. They remind you of why you're doing hard things. Um, they remind you of why it's all worth it. And so they're incredible sources of truth in choice point moments where you're deciding, am I a yes or a no to this? Or, geez, that was a hard day. You know, do I really want to do this? Yeah. Um, and then I think the, the other things is, you know, that reminder, Stephen Covey in Seven Habits of Highly Effective People talks to us a lot about it's really easy to get distracted by the urgent unless we focus routinely on the important. So finding an anchor habit and practice to make sure these are the things that are guiding your day and your focus is really important because in the absence of it, we all know we're busy enough to get the day consumed by everything else. So it does take intentional practice and then it takes community to be able to bring it to life. So they would be my four things for people to think about in order to, to practice the idea of bringing this into our day-to-day -day life. Wow, that's so great. And speaking of interviews, I know that when you ask President Obama what his message would be to other leaders if they sat in the room with him and you and he spoke about choice so i would love if you could go into what he said and um and we'll take it from there yeah sure so i was very lucky in 2018 when president obama was in australia to to get the opportunity to to interview him uh, for an hour and uh, we ended up being a bit over an hour actually and talk about everything from his time in office to innovation to his passion for diversity but as, as we closed as you said we sort of talked about this idea of you know what's what's your takeaway and what was really interesting is you know he spoke it was a it was a closed room of sort of 300 Australian and New Zealand leaders so people of, of real influence and he really challenged them in a, in a in a constructive way I think to say you know there's a lot of people right now who are who are checking out you know, they're going, uh, whether it's frustration at, you know, their various um, uh, political offices with frustration at Washington or here in Australia, frustration at Canberra or whatever it might be, people sort of saying, oh, how bad's leadership and isn't this frustrating? This isn't good enough. And he said, you know, I, I just want to challenge you all that the progress is never a foregone conclusion. You know, that takes work every day. Each and every one of us has to show up and contribute to that. 
And he said, plant where your feet are. Because he was making this observation that there are a lot of people that were going, oh, I'm just going to move to New Zealand or I'm just going to go, you know, live in Spain or something like that. And sort of these people that were really influential and that could have an extraordinary power to mobilise good, they were just going, oh, I'm just a bit deflated. I'm a bit over it. Yeah. You know, I'm a bit done. And I love that idea of planting under your feet and that responsibility all of us had. You know, it's right. We stand on the shoulders of giants in this generation of, you know, I, th I think about it, Erica, even in women's rights, right? Like the choice that we have to do what we do that our mothers and grandmothers and great grandmothers never had. Yeah. And the responsibility that then comes with that to plant under our feet. So, you know, if and when we have kids and grandkids and what have you, they're enjoying, you know, choice and freedom and opportunity to an even greater level and making sure as well, we're not just doing that for people who look like us, but we're really mindful of doing that for, for everyone whose privileges are not equal to our own as well. Um, but I think the, that was such a powerful message and a, and a great challenge because I, I can understand where that mentality and frustration can come from, you know, particularly when we've got a news cycle that 90% of which is filled with things that aren't working and are broken. And it's very easy, I think, with the scale of the problems to sometimes be a little bit disillusioned about what we can do. But I think his message was this idea that, you know, again, take it back to your choices, take it back to your yeah. sphere of influence, take it back to things that you have an ability to positively shape every day and realize that is on each of us. And the only way any of this changes for the better is if each of us pick up that responsibility and do our little bit. You know, I've got great, uh, great kids down the road. Um, we moved to a new suburb during the lockdown. We were talking before we got started. We've been in the world's longest lockdown here in Australia, in Melbourne, which has been crazy. And there are kids up the road there, they're six and eight years old, and they instituted a sign out the front of their house during the lockdown. And they've got um, silly walks only, $1 fine. So every time they're always out the front of their house, and every time you go past the front of their house, they make you do a silly walk. They've never actually imposed the fine. But there's this idea of if you don't do it, there's a dollar fine on it. That's amazing. And I've just I watched that. these six and eight year olds spark joy in the whole neighborhood oh my because gosh, it starts that's the best thing laughter. Ever. And it starts conversation and it starts, their house is always covered in people because people are always talking out the front and they've built community. And these are two primary school kids, elementary school kids, right? Oh my and gosh. Like, that is leadership in action. That's what President Obama is talking about in action. It's going, what can I do in my little world? I can't do a lot of the stuff I'd normally do, but hey, I can try and make people smile today. And people aren't smiling enough at the moment. And this is what these kids were motivated by. Like, how do we make people laugh? And how do we make people smile? Because the world could do with more with it right now. And I just love that. And for me, that's a really great example of how do we bring that back to each of us? You know, if, if we're just about how do I show more care and more joy in my interactions or how do I practice more gratitude or how do I make more intentional choices about my environmental footprint? All of that is such a force for good. Don't, don't give up your agency and your power in these big conversations because you've got it. Wow. I, I just felt overwhelmed with joy just by hearing that, that those kids did that. How it's sweet awesome, isn't it? and amazing. Oh my gosh. I, I love it. It just gives me chills because it is, it, I could imagine I had the whole visual of people doing that and how much joy that would bring them at a time that so many people feel fear. So that's Absolutely. amazing. Thank you for sharing that. And I think to me, I think choice is the most powerful thing we have. It is so freeing and we all have mm. the choice and it's up to us to make the choice that's in alignment with our soul, in alignment with good and love, and, and obviously for the better good of everybody, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So I know you also share in your book, uh, there's some tools for intentionally framing choices. Can you walk us through some of those? Yeah, absolutely. So I think this is such an interesting one because we are overwhelmed by information and we're overwhelmed often by choice. And one of the, the great things, one of my mentors, um, some of your audience might know her, she's a seven-time world champion surfer, uh, Lane Beachley, who used to tear it up on US beaches uh, all year round uh, and still a great figure in the global surfing community too. Um, she always says to me, it's, it's, um, it's either a hell yeah or it's a, I don't want to use an expletive, but it's a hell no. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And, and this idea of, you know, to begin with, you know, check in with yourself. If you, it's not an opportunity that lights you up. If it's not something that really excites you, it's probably something that needs to sit in the no bucket. But one of the conversations we've had a lot over the years is it's like a coffee filter. You've got to think about the idea of what am I filtering my choices through regularly? And you need to check in and update that filter. So you're making sure you're making decisions on what matters to you now, not things that maybe mattered six months ago, six years ago, you know, 25 years ago. 
And so, you know, for me, it's really important on just getting clear on what are your decision making criteria for your choices, you know, and one of them, uh, everyone's got their own, but one might be, does it align with my purpose? Tick, first criteria, nothing's getting out of the blocks, but it's not aligned for me with why I'm here. Second is align with my values. Um, you know, is, is this an organization or opportunity where I'm going to get to live the way that I want to live and that stands for the things that I stand for? You know, tick, second opportunity. You know, and then people get a lot more specific to them. And these are things that will be relative to your goals. You know, does this give me the opportunity to work with people um, that are really values aligned and that I can learn from? Is this going to give me the opportunity to progress towards being further along relative to my aspirations and goals than when I was before I took this opportunity? Does it stretch and challenge me? I love when you were talking before about leaning into fear and uncertainty. You know, I, I always see that as a good sign when I feel a little bit uncomfortable I know I'm growing. So I actually look for that feeling and going, oh, okay, I must be stretching here because this doesn't feel easy. Um, and I want to lean into that because I know that means growth around the corner. So uh, for me, it's about, and the most important thing I can say to people is this is really worth doing a check-in with yourself before you're making choices because it's really easy. And, and this is what Lane used to say to me all the time. We're really good at rationalizing things to ourselves, which means we're telling ourselves rational lies. So all of us can kind of justify something after the fact. We can go, oh, you know, and, and the moment we're in an opportunity, you know, take a job offer, you're sitting there and someone's talking to you about it. We can start telling ourselves the story of why we should take it. We can start telling ourselves the story of why we shouldn't. We can end up stuck in the middle of our own tug of war, right? And then everyone we invite into the conversation will pull us one way or the other. Whereas if we've actually gone into that conversation, gone before I go job hunting, let me get really clear on my filter criteria. What do I want in this next opportunity for me? How am I going to write it down? And then how am I going to consider these opportunities as they come through and go, well, does it match them all? Does it match four out of five, seven out of eight, however many you've got? Um, and being, and you know, you can filter them over time and maybe you're looking for the one that goes the furthest. There may not be something all the time that meets every single one of our filter criteria. But then we're really clear on what we're evaluating things through. Versus this idea that we're sort of, you know, oh, 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 I see a lot of people who are stuck in um, kind of just choice overwhelm. You know, there's this sort of inability to make a decision by virtue of the fact that there's always data points, there's always more, there's always new. And if we're not really clear on what matters most to us, that can make it really difficult to move forward and actually make choices. And you and I know to not make a choice is a choice in itself. So we need to challenge ourselves on the idea that just because you haven't moved, doesn't mean you're not making choices and you need to be really mindful if not making a choice is the choice that you want to make. Yeah. And everything you mentioned takes really a lot of awareness of yourself. And that's why we have to be the leader of ourselves. And this is the type of work that we need to go through. And, and, and once you start asking these questions and implementing these things in your life, it will become more natural where you don't have to think as much about it. It will just totally. be a natural awareness that you check yourself. So yeah, I, I think it's so great what you just shared. And I know also you share a powerful exercise uh, that you learned uh, to allow to reframe how we actively choose to show up. Do you uh, recall what exercise I'm talking about? Are you talking about the acting exercise in terms of the narrative? I think it was uh, the champions eat... Uh, Feedback, something breakfast. I'm trying to remember. Like I said, I read this a couple months ago, but uh, yeah, it was it was just actively choose like being in choice of how you show up. Cool. I'm just I'm thinking about different stories that that might be, but I'm um it's not like leading me to one in particular where I'm like, oh, that might be the one that you're talking about. Um, I think I it was something the along the. You. I think it was something along the lines of champions eat constructive feedback for breakfast or something along. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. I mean, that's definitely a, a chapter for sure. So, I mean, in that chapter, we're talking a lot about the idea of um, feedback and the importance of, of okay. seeking feedback. Could that be what you're talking about? Yes, exactly. But that, I think that was something else, but yes, t talk about that. Cause I, it stood out to me. So I'm trying to remember everything I read in the book. Again, I read this a couple months no, ago. No, so no, no. You're all good. Absolutely. Um, so, I mean, champions eating constructive um, feedback for breakfast, I guess, is just the important of understanding the power of our own feedback loops in our life. Um, and I, sh you know, I think it's probably something 
interestingly that you know in many ways millennials and gen z's are really good at because we're a generation of gamers and that's male or female the data is quite extraordinary around sort of gaming uh, and so we're used to kind of this instant feedback i mean games tell us all the time every time we're, we're playing a level we're getting feedback we're either passing it or we're not we're either you know doing it with more points than last time or working effectively with people we're collaborating with in a multiplayer game or we're not and life uh, isn't so much like that. You know, we think about the, the once a year performance review structure and things like that that are happening in organisations and it's a little bit different. So we, I think one of the things that's really important is, you know, this idea of actively seeking feedback and, and this notion of building feedback into our, our practice um, and also being mindful of, well, you know, we talk a lot in the book about making sure that we understand feedback through its lenses. So it's really easy um, to have feedback that triggers identity um, triggers, or this is what the feedback literature talks about. And when we hear that, it can often challenge us, you know, and there are, there are kind of three sets of, of triggers. There are truth tr triggers, which happen when we view feedback as sort of unfair or we become defensive to it, we sort of reject it. So we say, oh, that's not true. I don't do that or I'm not like that. Um, then there's relationship triggers where there's actually something about the idea that the person giving us feedback or the relationship we've got with them triggers us. So sometimes people can have that with, you know, close friends or partners giving them feedback and things like that, where there's actually a challenge around that dynamic. And then the most challenging actually the identity triggers. So, you know, something in the feedback causes us to question ourselves. So we actually think of ourselves as a failure and we, it's therefore easy to interpret, interpret that we shouldn't try anymore. And these are often the most problematic triggers so to avoid those identity triggers you know we talk about this in the book we need to kind of stop getting stuck in all or nothing identity labels you know I acknowledge we're actually really nuanced and and complex creatures you know in, in my own experience you know, I used to find it really hard um, I'd get stuck around feedback you know I was someone that really wore the identity label of responsibility and so anytime I felt like I I dropped the ball I didn't follow through to the level that I should you know things didn't play out the way that I wanted to I would be really triggered by that. And it would it'd be really kind of confronting to my identity because hold on, I'm a responsible person. So how did this happen? And, you know, I, I'd sort of see myself as almost being attacked at a core identity level. And so I think we need to realize that we, you know, are much more complex than that and go, actually, you know, there's a difference between that interaction and who I am as a person. And I need to understand the feedback as responsive to that particular situation and project and that can be held in tension with the fact that I still am a really responsible person, but for a matter of reasons, this didn't turn out the way that I would have liked. And what can I learn and be curious about moving forward? Um, and I think finding people in your life that can be those healthy sources of feedback. I mean, people talk a lot about the role of mentors in sport. We see it all the time. Everyone who performs at a high level has got a coach and that coach's role is to give feedback, whether that's, you know, sure. encouragement at moments where we need encouragement, whether it's pep talk at moments we need that. But it's also, you know, honest truth. You know, that wasn't as good as it could have been. Let's talk about how we do it better. So carving out those uh, feedback relationships is one of the most important things we can do in our careers and making it safe for feedback to be given by people who love us and care about us uh, is another one. So I think that, you know, we, we tend to see a lot more discussion of feedback than practice of it. And so if I can encourage people to kind of move that from an idea into action, you'll start to see extraordinary benefits. Um, and I think it, it comes from, you need a mantra around it often because feedback can be quite confronting. We can go, Absolutely. oh, this is just everyone telling me I'm not good enough, right? And so it needs to be, you know, these are nuggets of gold that are allowing me to get better. Or um, every, time, every time I take on feedback, I get a little bit, you know, and apply it, I get a little bit better tomorrow um, than what I am today. And I encourage people that the work of Marshall, um, uh, in the book that we talk about with feed forward is something really worth leaning into. So this is idea of versus, you know, the retrospective in the mirror, actually saying, hey, friends, hey, mentors, hey, colleagues, this is one thing I'm really working on changing. Mm. Um, or one thing I would love you to suggest that I could change moving forward that would make your interactions with me more productive, more powerful, more impactful. Um, could you nominate something for me? Or you might share something that you're working actively on changing seek their input and suggestions on how you might do that and then invite them to be a part of holding you accountable. So what I like about that is it's less confronting to talk about what we're doing moving forward because we haven't done it yet. It's therefore not a reflection on us and our identity so much as it is an aspiration of, hey, I'm working on being a better me. Can you help me do it? 
And I find the feed forward idea a lot more, um, a lot more powerful and positive and, and just less, less making us kind of armor up and more open to kind of actually th this role that feedback can play in helping me get close to my goals, mm. closer to being the version of me I want to be. So I encourage people to think about that feed forward idea in particular. Who are the people you'd want to invite into those conversations? And how do you say, here's something I want to change for me or, or what's something you would invite me to challenge myself to change moving forward as opposed to kind of looking back and doing a post-mortem on what you've done before? That's such great advice because I think anytime we un it unexpectedly get feedback that is somewhat triggering to us, we tend to react to it. So I think if we do what you said, we basically, we welcome it already. We are preparing for it. We're asking for feedback. So I think instead of reacting negatively because we're triggered, we're now actually listening and receiving and able to take it in more to heart opposed to a reaction. So I think that's a good approach and that it's a good thing to think about because I think that, again, if, if somebody loves us, they're gonna to wanna to give us positive feedback to help us grow and improve. They're not doing that to tear us down really. So totally. it's just, it might be triggering when we're not expecting it. So yes, it's, it's definitely a reframe. And, and it's a great way of, of challenging yourself to reframe even in what you yeah. said there, that it's only people who love us who are prepared to um, give us the feedback that can allow us to grow. And, and that's where it really gets the intention of who you, how you set boundaries. We're not talking about letting anyone come in and give you feedback here. This is people that you really value. This is people yeah. that you trust. Um, you know, people, people outside of that circle, you don't give them permission to speak in. Don't give them permission to disrupt you and the way you're going about what you're doing. You need to safeguard who it is you bring into the feedback circle. That's really important. Yeah. Yeah. So true. Uh, one of the things I know you mentioned that I want to pull out is how your life pretty much shifted completely when you started, instead of managing your time, you started managing your energy. Can you explain that and how that shift transformed your life? Yeah, big time. And, and look, this came from getting it wrong, right? Like I was like many A type personalities, someone who saw sort of 24 hours in a day as a challenge for how many things I could fit into it, you know, and when I look at my early 20s and look, that's a great approach until it's not, you know, more often than not at some point, uh, you hit a wall with that. And I certainly did. I was um, diagnosed with depression, you know, in my early 20s and had to go through this process of sort of rebuilding the fundamentals um, and, and getting clear on um, what had got me here and how do I make sure I never end up here again? And uh, probably as hard as it was a period to, to work through and live through, it's probably one of the best things that ever happened to me because of the strong foundations I've rebuilt um, that I really feel are so much more robust and resilient. Uh, and, and I'm just living life in a way that's so much more congruent with me. It's really easy, I think, to take on other people's expectations and beliefs and make them your truth. Um, or to give yourself unwittingly to what other people want you to be doing. And then when you have a moment like that where sort of everything falls apart, it's very interesting to see who's there and what matters. And one of the things that was critical in that recovery period, you know, to being able to, there, there are days where I couldn't get out of bed, you know, it was a, it was a um, in the scheme of things, I was very lucky to, to have, you know, recovery that, did, that lasted under a year. But I know um, for a lot of people, it, it can be a longer challenge than that. But in my lived experience, you know, one of the things that became really critical at that time was managing energy ruthlessly because I didn't have much of it anymore. Hmm. And so I had to really be curious around what are the things that I'm doing and the people I'm spending time with who light me up? What are the things that suck energy for me? I'd never, never paid attention to that before because I always had bucket loads of it seemingly or I could just, I was unaware I could push through. I wasn't as attuned to that sort of stuff. I wasn't in my body if I look back really. Hmm. I was kind of all headstrong and, and just powering through. And so I, I made this shift and I read this book called The Power of Full Engagement that really transformed it. And that was a book that was looking at high-performing athletes and what's the difference between a world number one and a world number 10 and a world number 100. And it talked about this idea of what these people are really good at is managing energy. They're good at taking micro breaks. They're really intentional about their routines. They're performing at the highest level, but no one can do that unsustainably. So it's this power of really thinking about, you know, how am I structuring my approach, knowing what I need to do to perform? And then how am I really mindful of recharging and re-energizing? And so that became a mantra for me during that period, but one that I've extended into my life in the decade and a bit since, where 
you know, I now look at my days and weeks and go, okay, I know, firstly, I always encourage people to do an energy audit. So just check in and be aware of in a week, what time do you wake up? What time are you at your most creative and energized? What time are you at your kind of lulls in the day? Because we've all got our own circadian rhythm and they're all a little bit different. I've got friends that are night hours. I've got friends that are early birds, everything in between. Um, and then I want you to think about this idea of what, uh, how do I match my energy to my activity? So what of your activities deserves your high energy moments in the day? So if you're a morning person, you get really fired up between hours of 8 a.m. and 10 a.m. That's probably your highest energy point of the day. Don't, don't, don't spend that on email. Yeah. Don't spend that on things that are really inconsequential. Think about what are the big rocks I've got to move? Is this the time I spend focusing on my most important relationships? Is this the time I spend, you know, strategizing on my new creative projects? Is this the time I spend in um, journaling and kind of deep contemplative self-work that's going to help me get that next breakthrough? Whatever it might be, make sure that that activity deserves that energy mm. and, and save those things that don't require the best of your energy for those uh, lower energy moments. We can, we can bust through emails in any state of the day that we're in. We might have to save some of the ones that really require us to be creative, but the majority of that sort of stuff is quite easy to do in those lower moments. So think about that and then try and readjust just nothing else, but just changing where you're putting key activities in the day based on your energy levels. Then the final thing I would say is think about how you insert some, some energy building blocks and circuit breakers. So each of us have got things that we do for ourselves that make us feel like the best version of us. You know, for me, that's exercising every day. For some people, it's uh, reading. For some people, it might be journaling. It might be quality time with, with people that they love. But those things are, need to be building blocks of days and weeks, not stuff we slot in if we've still got time after everything else. Because it's actually doing those things that nourish us and put us in the best possible energy state to give ourselves to everything else we want to be involved in. So putting that as an anchor, even if it has to move where it is in the day, the idea that that goes in the day as a priority um, and then it, it, everything fits around it or that goes in your week as a priority and everything fits around it is, is a really powerful shift. It, it takes discipline because it's really easy to kind of, you know, it's not going to be, th be the thing that demands your attention. Everything else will jump in your email inbox or ping your phone or et cetera, et cetera. So it will take discipline to maintain it. But doing those two things alone will fundamentally change the game for you. It certainly has for me. I've been blown away by how much of a difference it's made to my quality of life, my focus, my productivity. And the final thing I'll say is a lot of people say to me with, with circuit breakers or energy things in particular, oh, but I'm so busy, you know, so I can't get to the gym for an hour. So I don't go. I can't get to the full yoga class. I can't meditate for the full 20, 40 minutes, whatever it might be. So it's not one of those doing. saying those things, like at least yeah. for the meditation, I'm like, I can't fit in, but go ahead. <laughs> no, and, and it's so true. So we let perfect be the enemy of the good. And one of the really interesting areas of, of kind of research for the book was this evolving body of work that um, doctors are talking about called micro breaks. Mm -hmm. um, and I feature a doctor, Jamie King, in the book where she talks about this research they're seeing where we need to challenge our thinking because the data shows us that that's not true. The data says take 10 deep breaths sitting where you are and you will see a positive physiological benefit. The data says get up and do jumping jacks on the spot between your Zoom meetings or, you know, go for a walk around the block uh, for three, five minutes and you will see a positive physiological change. So actually what we need to challenge ourselves to do is create these minimum viable habits. You know, what's going to be my circuit breaker? That I'm going to insert into the day, whether I'm coming out of a low energy state, whether I'm trying to shift my energy after a tough conversation or interaction, whatever, so that I don't let that drag through my day. I can intentionally kind of break and reset and go again. So I really want to encourage people to think about, you know, what's a micro habit? If you think about something you know that brings you energy, how do we bring it down to its, its smallest viable option? 10 deep breaths, 12 jumping jacks, three minute walk, any of those sort of building blocks. And then how do you think about, you know, being really intentional about anchoring them, whether that's certain times of the day, like I'm going to do that. I know I have an energy low at 1030. So I'm going to head out then. Or I'm going to seize the moment between every interaction I have to do this, you know, uh, daily, you know, in every, every break I've got. It's a really, really powerful idea that I think is really encouraging because for so many of us who the limiter for a long time has been, oh, I can't get X amount of time. So I can't, won't. This actually says, well, if you can get this amount of time, you can and you should. 
Absolutely. I think that's so val valuable what you shared. I know that for myself, sunshine does that for me. So when I mm. need a kind of like recharge. You're living in the right city. Yeah, exactly. So that helps. Of course, not everybody has so many sunny days, if you want to say, but I know that it's one of the things that has really helped me just like stopping and knowing I, if I just go out in the sunshine, go read, it kind of recharges me and just kind awesome. of like ignites parts of me. Uh, so yes, I, I think that's so valuable that people have to kind of evaluate what uh, sucks your energy, what gives you energy. And I, I love that micro little breaks. Uh, so as your book is broken down, we talk about how to lead yourself and then lead others. And I know like there's so much in just, I think the importance of this episode is leading ourselves, but uh, you also include mastery in part of that. And I love that you uh, shared that there's some questions we should be asking ourselves on this path of a lifelong learning. What are those questions that you feel are most important and essential that we should be asking ourselves? Yeah, well, lifelong learning for me is such an important topic and particularly in the context of where we find ourselves in the world right now. You know, when we think about all that we all that we read about, about the future of work, all that we're seeing at the moment in terms of the way that the world is changing, you know, it makes it all the more critical, I think, that all of us are embracing this idea of, you know, we we absolutely need to understand that the world is is changing on us all the time and thinking about how am I going to set myself to be successful relative to that? Um, and, you know, for me, there's a, so I guess what I'm encouraging people to do in that regard is there's, there's importance of each of us being really intentional about always learning something, uh, always unlearning something and always relearning something. And so from that end, you know, I often say to people with a learning uh, disposition, you know, when was the last time that you did something for the first time? There's that importance. The only way we're learning is if we're doing things that we're a beginner at. And there's so much importance, not even necessarily in the content that we're learning in that moment, but in maintaining our ability to pick things up and learn. Actually being a good learner is a really important future-proofing skill because what we know about the world is, you know, we're talking to kids who are graduating school right now about the 18 careers that they're going to have over the course of their lifetime, most of which don't exist yet. Those of us that are beyond graduating are not, are not removed from that equation. We're going to be a part of that change and rapid transformation. We're going to have to reinvent ourselves as industries change and job opportunities shift. And so that importance of, you know, just being in the discipline of learning, whether that's picking up a, a DIY skill, whether that's learning a language on Duolingo, whether that's, you know, picking up something that's more to do with your, your work pursuit or a total extracurricular, that discipline of learning how to learn, that discipline of being okay with the discomfort of being a beginner it's a really interesting part I really found it when I stepped into my own business six years ago it was really uncomfortable being a beginner when I'd spent you know a decade before that building discipline in an area that I then knew really well like I went to work and I just I knew how to do it every day and all of a sudden I was in this world where I so many things were new and I really had to learn how to be a beginner and I see this as a real limitation at a challenge area, more for people who are later in their career and really established than for those junior, because there's been a longer distance often between when we last put ourselves in a learning situation. Right. Um, being okay with, I don't know, being okay with asking, can you help me? Can you teach me? They are really powerful things to be able to get comfortable with. So I encourage people to think about what am I learning and and who, what environments am I putting myself in to, to learn? But that, that discipline of understanding, it's almost as important just to be in the habit of learning as it is the learning that you're doing. Unlearning for me is often the one that we don't talk about um, enough. Uh, and in that regard, I think it's, you can make the argument that a lot of what we need to do right now is actually unlearn things that we've been doing for a really long time. And often the sort of stuff that, that we should be unlearning is the stuff where we say, oh, because we've always done it that way. Um, and unlearning is the harder part because we're pretty hardwired with habits, you know, up to 42% of our day happens on autopilot. So this intentional piece of sitting with yourself and going, what do I need to stop doing? Because this no longer serves me. You know, is that a habit that you, uh, is that a, is that negative self-talk? Is that the idea that you're running your day according to time, not energy? Is that the fact that you're in, in an opportunity that you really doesn't light you up and you actually need to make that choice to finally do something that aligns with your passion and purpose. Um, whatever that is for you, you know, there's going to be some stuff in there that we've got to unlearn. It might be, you know, the way that you interact with certain types of people. It might be, you know, there's all manner of habits that, that drive people's day. 
So sitting there and going, what do I need to stop doing? What do I need to unlearn my relationship with? Because it is not assisting me to grow. It is not moving me towards the best version of myself or the next opportunity. That's really important. And then I think the final one is relearning. And it's kind of the forgotten cousin of learning and unlearning. But basically, it's an integral part of the learning process. And it's really comes down to the fact that we, we've we learned things and sometimes we, we've had them dormant for some time and they take on a level of relevance again. Um, so we actually, like I think about a lot of people I meet who will really describe themselves as creative when they were younger, would not at all describe themselves as creative as the professional that they are at this point in their career. And yet we look at what the World Economic Forum talked to us about, world's most critical future skills and creativity is, you know, in, in the top 10 of almost anything mm. we can read saying this matters. So there's all these people who need to relearn, actually you had creativity in you, all of us do, but we've, we've learned ourselves out of it. Yeah. We've learned structure and discipline and routine and we, we don't know imagination and out of the box thinking and play anymore. And so there can be things like that where it's actually like, how do I reinvigorate that for myself? So, uh, myself? And so the question there, I think, is really what, have, what are you no longer doing that you need to reinsert or um, make reappear in your life? Yeah. And that's the relearning piece. What am I going to do to create the environment, the safety, uh, the, the opportunity for that skill to come back to life and for me to be able to apply that again? And also I'll add to that with relearning. I think that sometimes because we are constantly evolving as we should be and growing, we, we can revisit the same thing and learn something new. That's why repetition is the mother of mastery. And as we're talking about is mastery is really to master yourself. It's repetitively doing something. And as you evolve, you will gain a little insight, a new insight that will just strike you at a different time because you've grown. So I think to add to relearning, that is super important. And and so moving into just to touch on a little bit, because I don't want to take up your whole day. uh, And there's so much shared in your book. And like I said, what I love with every chapter is there is an exercise to now implement what you learn. So I think it's such a beautiful book and I can't wait to finish it all because it's so insightful, but going into leading others, you talk about this leading from the front. And I'm curious, what, what is a true leader need to embody and believe to be able to lead from the front? Yeah, look, it's a great question. And, and I think there are a couple of things we've kind of already touched on in, in answer to that, that I would, I would say are really important to that. You know, one is what do we know about leaders that lead from the front and leaders that, you know, if we just reflect on ourselves and who we follow, you know, whether that's, you know, kind of passively through social media because they inspire us and, and we find what they do inspirational, whether that's more actively, we've chosen to go work for them, we've chosen to go vote for them, we've chosen something like that. Um, and I, I think we would all say that leaders who are leading from the front have a, a vision, you know, they have a vision of, a world that's better than the world that it is right now when we buy into their vision and the conviction that they talk about that vision with. And, and the importance of the conviction there is they help us believe that that vision can be real. Uh, and then they help us understand how we can take active steps towards it. So I think good leaders who lead from the front have, have that vision. Um, I think they're courageous enough, as we talked about earlier with some of these great figures, to, to speak that into the world, to stand for it, to defend it um, without a question. And then I think they're really intentional with their day-to-day practice of every day trying to move the ball a little bit further towards that version of the world. Um, And they invite other people to come on that journey with them. You know, leaders, you can't be a leader if no one's following. So leaders are are also really good at going, okay, how do I bring others along as part of this community, as part of this movement, as part of this team, whatever it looks like. They create space for others to join in and for others to bring their own skills and vision into and make a contribution to that collective. But I think they're some of the things that leaders do really well. Um, they, they make us fired up about the prospect of, you know, the world looking different in the future. They make it tangible and real as to how we might get there because if it's too far removed, we, we, won't, we won't believe in it. We won't think it's realizable. And so we'll, we'll check out or we won't get as actively involved as if they make us feel it's real. And then they invite us to be involved in some way. They create space for us to co- contribute, to be a part of the team, to belong, um, and to show up and, and be a part of making good that change we want to see in the world. Uh, it's, so, it's so great. I think that um, 
everybody has the ability to be a leader. I think a leadership leader is made. You're not necessarily, mm-hmm. I, I think some people have leadership qualities that they're born with. I think, you know, it comes down to attributes that we are uh, inherit to all have, but some of us have more strength in certain attributes of a leader, but it leader is made. It's determined by others. I've heard this saying before that it's not something you claim that you are. It's something that you embody and it's something that people see in you. So they yeah, are claiming you as the leader per se. So it's, it's so great. There's so much about this. And I think that's so, it's so critical today more than ever when it seems like our world is so divisive and there's so many different uh, narratives and opinions and, you know, obviously a lot of things going on in the world today that more leaders need to start showing up and embodying these qualities and really start from, as you say, leading ourselves and then moving into leading others. And through your book, you walk through so much of this. It's, it's so insightful. I could say it again and again, because it really is. And I, I love it. It's such a beautiful read. Uh, so just out of curiosity, if you, I, I would love to hear, cause you studied quite a bit, obviously interviewed so many brilliant minds. If you were to recommend, let's say three books that you feel has really taught you so much about leadership or you know, again, leading ourselves besides your book, because of course I want people mm-hmm. to grab your book, but what, what books have really inspired you to deepen this work and understand it so much more? Yeah. And I might focus on maybe leading self, given that's been a good chunk of our conversation. Cause there's, there's different literature I'd go to for, for yeah, different parts of, of that puzzle. I would say uh, Brene Brown's Daring Greatly in terms of vulnerability right. and, you know, being prepared to um, unlock our big aspirations for what we're capable of being. And, and, you know, there's so much about, you know, sharing a vision with the world, setting ambitious goals that, that is I- intrinsically caught up in vulnerability. So I think Brene Brown's work in that regard is really great. A, a classic for me is Stephen Covey's seven habits of highly effective people. There's, there's so much of that in, that is just timeless. Um, and I, I think that's a great, uh, great read in that regard. And then, who would I nominate as my third? Oh, I'd probably, given we've talked about it and given it's often quite a new idea and it's been so transformative to me, I would read um, The Power of Full Engagement as well, which is the book all about kind of energy management and how we, we shift, you know, the way that we're, we're structuring our lives and days um, to be able to make a really, you know, fun, fundamental difference to getting more out of us. So that's by James Law and, and Tony Schwartz. Um, and again, uh, I think quite a timeless classic. They're, they're doing a lot of work you know, with different editions to, to bring it even more into the now in the context, COVID context, but um, some of the principles in that are just quite, quite game changing. Very nice. I love those suggestions. Okay. And where can people best learn about you and what you offer? Is there any programs that you're offering besides your book? Is there anything else that people could interact more with you or where could they best find you to find out more? Yeah, look, well, thanks for the question and we'd love to connect with anyone. I mean, you can you reach me on any social media platform to begin with. Uh, you can check out uh, www.hollyransom.com. And excitingly, we've actually uh, taken the, the book and, and gamified it. So we're launching an app uh, mm-hmm. at the start of the new year. You can come on a month long challenge. Where we're actually going to be giving people the opportunity to put these ideas into practice because one of our theories is, you know, a lot of the challenges were also busy if we can't find a way of making this bite-sized and fun and building community around it, it's really hard to do. And so what we want to do is create a tribe of people who are, you know, being the change that they want to see in the world and, and stepping into that idea of, you know, what's the best version of me and how do I show up that way more often and create a tribe of people who are going to encourage me and help me to do that. So that'll be kicking off in on February 1, but you can sign up now and all the information's at the website. It's going to be really, really exciting. Uh, that's it's super exciting. Thank you for sharing that. I didn't know that. So I'll definitely be plugging all that in the show notes. So just in closer, closure, I always ask my guests a question that I am curious to hear your answer. So if you were to leave a piece of advice with anyone right now that you feel they need to hear right now from your life lessons, what would be that piece of advice you would like to leave with us? I think the thing I'd say at this moment because so much is in flux like we keep reading about the great resignation and people making all manner of changes and and COVID has just thrown so many things on on uh the head for people 
And we're also at just a fascinating time of change with technology and, and how the world of work shifting. I think the single most important thing each of us can be doing, and this, this is everyone's to define themselves. So this isn't, you know, you, you take this for what it means for you, is we need to start getting comfortable being uncomfortable. Nobody can sit here and say they know what the future is going to look like. Uh, if they can, they're a bit deluded, <laughs> I think. But what we do know is that the pace of change isn't slowing down anytime soon. The world's not getting any less ambiguous. It's not getting any less uncertain. So this is our new operating environment that we've got to find a way, not just to survive in, but to thrive in. And so I think that one of the most important things we can be doing is the commonality amongst all of that is it's really easy for that to be fearful uncertainty brings fear ambiguity brings fear you know anytime we're venturing into the unknown there's there's fear that that enlivens can i do this uh, will i be able to be successful in this will i know how to um will i have the answers in this and so the the thing i would encourage each of us to do is to start getting comfortable being uncomfortable so i, I encourage and it's an activity x for in the book you know to don't don't or draw a donut you know in the, in the donut hole we're talking about our comfort zone, the things we're really good at. We could also call it a strength zone. You know, there's stuff that's gotten us to where we are right now. But your listeners know, you know, the definition of insanity is thinking we can keep doing that stuff and we can get where we want to go tomorrow. That requires us to change. That requires us to do things we haven't done before. And so the, the donut itself is what I call the courage zone. And they're things that are a little bit beyond feeling comfortable for you right now. But they're things you nominate as, geez, if I could bring that into my wheelhouse, that would help me lead and succeed in new situations and opportunities. And I should be intentional about working on that. So whether that's something, a technical skill, like, geez, it'd be great if I felt comfortable public speaking because to be able to be in the general manager role, I have to be comfortable public speaking. You know, whether that's the idea of, you know, learning to say no and set better boundaries, you know, whether that's um, getting better at handling conflict, all of us will draw our courage zone a different way. But if I encourage people to, to take the time to draw that courage zone, circle just one thing, pick one thing that you go, if I could do that more, that would make a profound difference to myself and to the impact that I have in the world and the way that I show up for people. And then just think about how to break that down in some bite-sized steps. Don't try and do that in this extreme form. Don't decide you're going to jump straight into a conflict conversation or go and talk in 500 or 500 people. Think about some small bite-sized ways you can pursue um, making that something you feel more comfortable with. Because the really encouraging thing when we step into our courage zone is our comfort zone actually starts to expand. The world doesn't end. We realize new capability and potential. And that journey, again, it's a bit like what we talked about with learning. It's a skill that we need to build because it's, it's required for us to be future-proof and future-ready. And so get comfortable being uncomfortable is the thing I'd leave at your audience with. It's so perfect. I love how you walk us through that. Thank you so much. So valuable and so true. And just to kind of, I, I want to hear your personal place of discomfort. Is there anything that you are doing right now to get you outside your comfort zone? Like one thing that you are leaning towards? Yeah. I mean, I think that's part of always, um, always knowing that you're growing. So, I mean, this, this whole, uh, you know, we're developing a whole bunch of new products like the app and stuff at the moment that are really outside my known universe. And it's really fun, but it's also, um, you know, it involves me a whole lot of new things that I'm learning, new material, new conversations, new technical experts I'm dealing with. So there are big parts of that that um, are you know, outside my known universe and in my courage zone. And, and I'm leaning into that because I think it'll be really exciting what we can create through these tools. Um, but this is certainly not my, my known world. So that would be, that would be one right now that I'm living amazing. and breathing. Amazing. Amazing. Ah, oh, this has been so great. I am just so honored to have you on and just the whole conversation that every, you did so much research, obviously through all your years in interviews and, you know, all, all the work is your speaking events. You've learned so much and you've shared this in a lot in your book. And just to gain the insight that you have spent years gathering on your own and sharing with us is it's so great. And this interview with you has been such an honor, Holly. I just appreciate you so much. And again, coming from all the way from Australia, and I know it's early in the morning for you. So I just thank you for making the time and effort and sharing all your wisdom with us today. Thank, thank you. you so much for having me. And as I said, Erica, congratulations on the community that you've built. It's, it's such a privilege to be able to, to speak into it. So thank you. Ah, thank you so much.